Thanks for joining this session to learn about how customers are leveraging AWS storage services to address different business requirements. Uh, I realize that we are standing between you and PubCrawl, and I uh, hope you find these customer stories interesting and applicable. My name is Sabina Joseph. I manage the storage partner ecosystem globally, and Isaiah Weiner, who will be closing this session, is the storage partner solution architect. I'll provide you a brief overview of AWS storage options and uh, some customer use cases. However, these customer use cases are uh, not meant to represent the universe of use cases that customers leverage in AWS storage. The primary stars of the session are our three customers. Uh, State of Texas, Department of Health Services, has a powerful transformational story of how they move from a traditional on-premise IT model riddled with complexity, cost, and operational issues to an AWS cloud-based consumption model replacing traditional NAS, and um, backup methodologies leveraging Cetera on AWS. H3 Biomedicine has a very cool story of how they leverage AWS storage and compute to do genomic analysis for cancer drug research and bridge from a traditional on-premise file-based workload, leveraging a viewer on AWS. Electronic Arts has a killer story of how they built a central and globally distributed storage and file distribution model, resulting in faster time to market for their blockbuster games due to phenomenal increase in collaboration speeds and file transfer rates, leveraging Panzura on AWS. We will end with Isaiah Weiner providing an overview of the AWS building blocks that you can leverage as your business needs grow, and hopefully some Q&A. So let's do a quick overview of the fundamental AWS storage options. Uh, the first one is Elastic Block Store, uh, which is our block storage service dedicated to EC2 instances and cannot be accessed by servers outside of AWS. It has low latency and consistent performance for demanding applications like file-based workloads and also, for, um, and also has advanced backup and recovery through snapshots and simplified server upgrades. Amazon Elastic File System is our file storage service dedicated to EC2 instances. It is very simple to use, has an easy system that you can use to launch and configure your file systems. It is elastic, scalable, supports NFS version 4, SSD base, and is fully managed. It has multi-AZ replication, similar to S3, so that customers can protect their data and EC2 instances can access their data across multiple AZs availability zones. S3 is a highly scalable object store that is ideal as an ingestion point for big data analytics, hosting static websites, delivering media content. S3 is simple to use. It is inexpensive and highly durable, 11 nines of durability. A few weeks ago, uh, you may have caught this, uh, we launched a new Amazon S3 storage class called Amazon S3 Standard Infrequent Access. It is for data that is less frequently accessed but still needs to be readily available when needed. Uh, the new storage class has low latency, high throughput, uh, and the same durability as S3 standard. It integrates to S3 standard and Glacier through S3 lifecycle policies, so customers do not need to change anything in their applications. Uh, and finally, we have Glacier for data that is infrequently accessed but still needs to be stored uh, for compliance and reference reasons. It is very low cost and the same durability as S3. One of the typical use cases that you guys use uh, in storage in general is backup and archive. Uh, in an on-premises environment, customers may be backing up some data, all of the data, have an aspiration to back up even more data. Hopefully, none of us are in this situation, including myself, of backing up no data. Uh, customers could be using a bunch of different methodologies, backup and archive software, disk, tape, offsite locations, multiple locations. 
Um, customers may have an aspiration to use AWS storage for backup and archive due to TCO, operational ease, uh, agility, elasticity. However, a customer's on-premise storage model may have a different set of protocols than the object storage model. Hence, um, you have two choices, either to write your own code to integrate into the APIs, or to use one of these cloud-enabled devices or cloud storage gateways. Uh, these cloud-enabled devices have the capability to translate from uh, legacy protocols to object storage protocols, have global namespace capabilities and API integration. Uh, there are a number of solutions uh, from AWS and our ecosystem of partners, so let's go through them very quickly. If you have Commvault Simpana or are considering Commvault Simpana, the architecture is very simple. Uh, it has native integration to S3 and Glacier, and this week launched integration to SIA, our new storage class. Commvault also has the capability to back up your data within AWS. If you have Veritas Net Backup or are considering Veritas Net Backup, uh, architecture is once again very simple. Net Backup has native integration to S3 and this week uh, launch integration to SIA. If you are using some other methodology or uh, some other software, you need to look at one or more of these other options. The first option is the Amazon Storage Gateway, which is a virtual device that can be downloaded and runs in your data center and presents a virtual tape library or a block iSCSI target to which uh, backup applications can write into. Once the data is written into the storage gateway, it caches and buffers it to local disk, and then it writes it to S3 or Glacier. Another option is NetApp AltaVault, formerly Steel Store, uh, which is an enterprise-grade storage gateway with 30x deduplication, encryption, compression, key management, and has integration to S3 and Glacier, and will be launching integration to SIA by the end of this year. Uh, it is available both in physical and in virtual forms on AWS Marketplace, uh, and it also has the capability to backup data within AWS. For remote and uh, branch offices, Citera provides a great gateway solution for backup, file sync and share with dedupe, compression, and encryption capabilities with integration to S3, and this week, launch integration to SIA, our new storage class. For endpoint devices, uh, Druva provides integrated backup and governance solutions. Um, and it actually is a SaaS solution, all-in SaaS solution that runs on AWS. And finally, uh, Zidara Virtual Private Storage Array is a fully managed enterprise-grade block and file storage service as storage as a service solution. And it has integration to S3, which they launched earlier this year. These are not meant to represent the universe of partner solutions out there. Uh, certainly, you know, you can visit the exhibit hall to learn more about these and other solutions that are available on AWS. If you have a traditional NAS environment, um, you may have storage filers from one or more vendors, have the capability to share and collaborate on data uh, across multiple locations, have file locking capabilities, and a global namespace that ties all these locations together. Uh, customers may um, want to replace this environment or extend it into AWS. Uh, one of the options today is customers can build their own filers, own NAS filers, or they can use one of these options, these hybrid architecture solutions. These hybrid solutions have a bunch of different capabilities. The first is enabling you to run file-based workloads within AWS. Uh, they may have capabilities to share and collaborate on projects and files across multiple locations, have file locking capabilities, and they all have a global namespace that extends into AWS. Let's review a few of these hybrid architectures. Uh, the first is the Amazon Elastic File System that I mentioned earlier, uh, which is simple, scalable, elastic, supports NFS version 4. Many of you might have NetApp in your existing environments, and you may be familiar with their operating system called ONTAP. 
Uh, this very same operating system is available on AWS called Cloud on Tap. Uh, it is, um, enables you to run NAS workloads in AWS or extend your existing NetApp environment into AWS. For remote and branch offices, Cetera provides a secure and a fully managed file system for backup and file sync and share capabilities. Um, Panzura. Panzura provides a great global file system and a SkyBridge solution that actually enables customers to collaborate on projects and files across multiple locations with file locking capabilities. It has a seamless hybrid architecture uh, that enables AWS storage and compute to appear as local. And finally, Avir uh, is a great hybrid solution, high performance NAS solution that sits in front of an on-premise IT environment and integrates an on-premise NAS workload into S3. It is available both in physical and in virtual forms. And this week, they launched their virtual product, Cloud Fusion, in AWS Marketplace. So having said all of this, I would like to bring on our first customer, uh, Mike Cardwell, CIO, State of Texas, Department of Health Services. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> brought my fan club. So I'm Mike Cardwell, the CIO for the Department of State Health Services. A lot of people still call us the Department of Health. Uh, but we're a regular uh, Department of Health agency, but we have a myriad of programs within that's not consistent with your typical health departments. But anyway, 12,500 employees. Uh, if you add our WIC clinics, it's about 550 locations. And it's about a $3 billion organization for our agency within about a $30 billion organization. Uh, organization for the, uh, the health enterprise, which is five agencies. We have somewhat of a schizophrenic type mission, and that's actually good and bad in some areas, but we, we're very diverse in our mission. And so just to cover a couple of things here over in, over in Family Community Health Services, a lot of direct care programs where we uh, provide, uh, you know, Title V entitlement type programs to, you know, children's special health care needs or kidney health, uh, a lot of direct care Medicaid, Medicaid programs. Uh, we've also got, got WIC under there, which is a very, uh, very large program nationwide and, and very familiar to a lot of people. On regulatory, it gets really interesting. Uh, we talk about everything from ambulances to zoonosis. Uh, and so we have ambulance drivers in there, massage parlors, tattoo parlors, all the good stuff. And of course, nothing controversial like abortion clinics. Uh, we also regulate our own hospitals. Uh, it gets to be interesting when there's an issue with one of the hospitals and we get this going on. Over in disease control, uh, this, is, this is a lot of our data. Uh, this is pretty much everything you can think of bad that can happen to a human, we track it. So this is our cancer data, this is our HIV STD data, uh, tuberculosis, uh, this is immunization data. So pretty much encounter, if you're thinking of Medicaid, uh, this, is, this is where it's happening as far as a track. And again, this is where most of our security uh, comes in, not only from the volume of data, but the types of data. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, statutorily, we've got a lot of uh, security around our mental health data. Mental health uh, can't be ignored. Uh, that's two-thirds of our agency. It's 8,000 employees. It's 13 hospitals. Uh, this is everything from a, a lockdown Hannibal Lecter-type facility to, you know, adolescent uh, home kind of uh, outpatient-type facilities. And so we, we see a, a broad spectrum there of patient services on mental health. Uh, which spills only not only to our state hospitals, but also to the, uh, the local health providers where we work with either local health departments, local mental health authorities. Uh, and of course, we have a lot of substance abuse and treatment programs that are about 99% of which is just a pass through to our entity, but we sponsor a lot of uh, substance abuse treatment. Uh, and again, statutorily, that's the, the most hard, uh, hardened rules around the, uh, the privacy and the uh, uh, protection of data. On vital stats, uh, this is everything, birth, death, divorce, uh, paternity, uh, everything, we, what we call the bookends, uh, and so if you're doing match, uh, this, is, this, is, this is generally the data that's going to start things or end things. Uh, with the latest Supreme Court rulings, we're pretty busy on this data right now, uh, you know, creating gender neutral things on our birth certificates and death certificates, uh, and of course marriage certificates are all in a mess right now, and so a lot of change going on there, and uh, I'm sure you didn't read about it in the papers. Uh, the last piece there is regional local health services, uh, this is boots on the ground. So 
little nuance in Texas statute is if the local county does not have a local health department, we are the health department. So we do everything from shock clinics to direct care to TB treatment, uh, some types of regulatory facilities where we're you know, doing the uh, uh, restaurant type inspections and things like that, but also a lot of emergency preparedness, uh, a lot of public health reporting. Uh, and so that's what keeps us busy, that extremely diverse mission we have. And again, keep in mind, that's about 12,000 employees. Uh, that is blank. All right, somebody didn't realize it set up that way. All right, so we start with the story, if you would, or the use case, and we're trying to figure out how to get from A to B. A being our number one cost driver in our state data center is storage and backups. And B being the number one depreciating cost in the marketplace is storage and backups. And so we're trying to figure out why, why things look good on the outside when they don't look so good on the inside. And of course, how do we get there? Keeping in mind we're not exactly cutting edge when it comes to uh, technology we already have and the skills we have and the architecture we have. And so we're trying to figure out how to get there. And so we looked at, you know, first, first step there, what are we going to do? We're going to get rid of a bunch of legacy file servers, which aren't, weren't only uh, OS aged out. We've got obviously space limitations. And of course, as you know, with all your employees, they love to save data, whether it's a spreadsheet or you know, voluminous quantities of Word docs, it just never stops growing. Uh, and so uh, we've, we're done with the arguments of trimming data and finding age data and begging people to trim it out. We're just, we've given in, we're gonna drink the Kool-Aid and tell them they can just, they can just store to their heart's content. Uh, and so we're trying to figure out how to grow this because obviously that's a lot. Uh, we're also looking for better availability. Uh, outages for some of our programs are not that big a deal. For some of them, it's a showstopper. Uh, and to give you a good example, you know, 1,000 babies born every day in Texas. Every one of them gets a hill prick. The blood goes to the lab, and we run a bunch of range of tests for very bad things on babies. And so simple data, spreadsheets, and of course their actual systems are down. You know, not only would babies die, literally you, you would miss treatments that could be prevented. And so there's a lot of things there for availability on some of our programs that were, were critical. And of course, like I was talking about some of these programs, HIPAA and PHI uh, protection was, was just paramount. Uh, you can't, as a state agency, we always worry about what's in the paper, uh, and so we don't want to be the guy in the paper. Uh, and so we talked a lot about HIPAA, how we're going to have that protection, uh, where we need to encrypt, make sure we did, not only at rest, but in transmission. And of course, from my perspective, I'm looking for where are the cost savings, you know, where's the cost benefit? You know, if we've been singing the story for a while about we can get more for less, then let's figure out how to get more for less. And so that was the biggest driver of kind of where we were and how we're going to get there. And of course, if there's any gravy on top that looks like additional functionality or features, that would be, that would be a real good bonus. Um, and so we started looking at like what we said. You know, it was a lot of what we don't want. We don't, we don't want more physical infrastructure on the floor. We're tired of that. You know, we don't want a big cap influx. That's, that's hurt for, especially for state budgets to get CapEx dollars. Uh, you know, time to deploy is a, is a real challenge, not only internally, but within our, uh, our consolidated data center. And, and that's actually creates more problems because it, it pins up demand. Uh, and we're also looking at, you know, what's going on with remote access. And of course, I'm inserting, we're gonna have something that looks like a cloud, acts like a cloud, smells like a cloud, which was really interesting. And I, if I, I'm gonna kind of jump forward a little bit here, looking back, the more education you can do, as often as you can do, do it. Uh, and there was some irony around this time. This is the whole, around the time Jennifer Lawrence had her pictures exposed. And so this whole concept of what is the cloud, when you're talking about people's file stores, you know, if it's, if it's people's Word docs, they're not too interested in it. But, you know, when you're talking about spreadsheets of, you know, tracking HIV encounter data, which in itself, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, having that data itself is an indication that someone has HIV, we always have to protect that. And so we spent a lot of time about, you know, why the cloud's good and how, how we could build that security from the ground up. And actually, you know, kind of did a little road show, got ahead of it as best we could around what's going on with the cloud. And, and, and really, we argued and, and demonstrated, quite frankly, we've got better security in our VPC than we do in our legacy data center. And we were able to demonstrate that. So we did, like most people that don't have a clue what they're doing, we reached out to our advisory services. And we said, look, this is what we're looking at. Uh, in, ended up being a cook-off, but we said, look, this is what we're looking at, this is what we're doing, and we have a good relationship with Gartner, and of course they were like, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, here's some functionality you're gonna need. Uh, don't forget, you know, the cloud is really the only place you're gonna be that's gonna give you the, uh, the flexibility and the agility you need, and so we started poking around at different, different products, different product offerings, uh, some of the uh, storage blocks that uh, Sabina was covering, looking at what we wanted, whether we want some things on-prem, some things cloud-only, and how to, how to approach that. And the 
kind of the saving grace of that is not only what we were working with with Gartner was that uh, we, we had a new CTO around that time that was very forward thinking. And so again, architecture wise, we were really, really trying to push this forward, which would be my second looking back. If you're from the IT side of things, even internally within IT, not the business unit, you're gonna have some struggles to overcome. And so be thinking about your own staff, getting them on board. Because uh, again, this is not a you know, Windows 2003 server sitting there. I mean, this is something different. It looks different, it acts different, and so uh, you're gonna have to think about the skill sets it takes, but also the internal resistance you're gonna face. Um, and of course, this is always fun to look at, mainly because every time you talk to the Gartner analysts, they, they really freak out on this quadrant because they constantly tell you how they had to rescale the, uh, the metric quadrant for AWS, and I think Andy even announced a different factor. We used to say it was five-fold over the competitors. I think Andy said this morning it was ten-fold over the competitors. So. Uh, obviously, we'd already, from a cloud provider, already gone that way uh, from some uh, infrastructure services uh, as, a, as a service. But of course, you know, we were looking at what's out there on how that interacts and the interfaces with that. So we did a cook-off. Uh, we looked at a couple things. Ironically, uh, when we <laughs> reached out to Gartner, uh, we weren't even looking at the appliance we ended up choosing. Uh, and they were not only giving us some good insight on functionality, but some, some, some players in the market uh, some of the ones that Sabina just talked about. But uh, we wanted to look at, you know, some kind of proof of, con proof of concept. And, uh, you know, if you looked at a couple slides there Sabina had, you know, the first thing that comes to my head, because I grew up on the ops side, is that's a NAS. It's never going to work. I'm skeptical. You know, this is never going to work. It's going to be slow. SIF traffic's going to kill it. And we did a proof of concept. We said, look, run every test you can, large files, small files, lots of SIF traffic, you know, failed packets, just blow it up. It's not going to work. We're gonna get out of here. And of course, we also looked at security and cost. And so through that cook-off, there was a couple in the stand that stood out. Uh, and of course, you know, pushing on cost and functionality, we made a product a choice there, went with uh, Cetera as our uh, file services platform, not only from their gateway, but also from the, uh, the replication piece it has to the S3 buckets. Uh, and it was interesting too, because it was around that time we locked ourselves into where we were going forward, uh, where the, uh, the, uh, the public cloud, and so, it was good because we uh, were evaluating whether we needed GovCloud or not, and so functionality-wise, uh, we, we ended up going forward with the Cetera appliance on, uh, on AWS. And we ended up with something that resembled our you know, IT as a service, and, and it was really good because you know, not only was the migration seemingly painless, a lot of people just didn't know we did it. I mean, other than the smart people that look at their map drive and go, what's that? Uh, you know, they didn't know. We, we did it left on a Friday. We were able to do some sync compatibility. And after hearing this morning, I'm really upset because we didn't have Snowball. That would have been nice about two years ago. Uh, it was, that, was, that was some struggles. We did learn some things on that. Uh, you don't want to flood it over the wire. And, uh, and again, we had a good sync, uh, sync compatibility on doing that. We also had some good uh, uh, instruction going out to, uh, to our end staff. And then we, we, we struggled where we were going to do, how we were going to struggle, uh, source this. And so we really said, look, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. Uh, plugged in some managed services on top of that to make sure that not only could we do the handoffs and the heavy lifting up front, but let's make sure we're using this forward. And then, of course, we want to make sure we can continue to expand the capabilities uh, as we go forward, which would be my third thing, looking back, keep the thing going. So we did a lot of rollout on the appliance. We, we lost a little steam, and now we're looking at the mobile client access and some extended mobile access. And so I would say that, you know, for that functionality, you want to keep that roadmap going and don't lose your, uh, don't lose your momentum. But uh, looking at that, we actually ended up some, some extras, some things we didn't think about. You know, we obviously have ubiquitous access now, whether it's through your mobile, cloud, uh, mobile client, through your browser. Uh, if you're at the office and your map drive is there, that's great, you're expecting that. But when you're at home, it's there. You don't have to run a VPN client. Uh, it'll run through your browser, through your mobile client. And we also had some good use cases where we wanted people to be able to use their, uh, those devices with the fruit on the back of it. Uh, they wanted to run that and be able to still access their map drives. And that's always a challenge because there's nothing there. And so for them to get that remotely, that was nice because there's a lot of, there are a lot of execs that are just married to those iPads and they just won't give them up. And so it was nice for them to have that access to things they didn't in the past and, of course, use that, use that data. Uh, but some of the additional benefits, you know, we ended up with an extra buy, backup client functionality. So we had some boxes that were, you know, uh, spaced out on our uh, legacy backup clients. And so we move forward with moving some of those things off to that. And also, long term, we'll be looking at backing up our desktops as well to this, as a, as a, again, as a self-service. And of course, some of the big things that really stood out was the resiliency, 
uh, a lot of disaster recovery and business continuity functionality that we just didn't anticipate. And so we're, we're again, quite pleased after that cook-off. So one of the things, again, that I was poking on um, was, you know, how we're going to get some ROI on this because we were looking at this as a cost savings out of the, our storage hemorrhaging that we were doing. And so uh, we really could have made this in a year one ROI, but the tagline was is just with, a, with about 750K up front, where, what our target was, I turned off about 1.3 million a year in file server spend. And so, you know, it took us a little while to get some of that tail end off, which would be the last lesson learned is, before you start all doing that, figure out where you're going to put DHCP, DNS, and print, because you need to think about that as you turn off your utility servers. Uh, but it was a real quick ROI. It was a no-brainer early on when we were looking at the pricing. And, and one of the things we really liked about the appliance was, you know, from a cost perspective or from a functionality perspective or a performance perspective, it actually gives you a lot of flexibility, whether you want to just put some low RPM, 7,500 RPM type storage in there, or you want to go all the way to solid state. So again, depending on what you're looking at for availability or storage, you had a lot of flexibility in that. And of course, we were just really pleased. Uh, even our CFO was pleased on some of, the, uh, some of the ROI we had. And we did actually a post-implementation comparison, and we were looking at some storage uh, block for block, 74% savings on what we, were, what we were paying to where we were going. And of course, we made a lot of people happy because they were no longer getting alerts about their S drives being full, uh, you know, whole divisions, you know, you know, putting things on their desktops because they just didn't have file server storage. And so it was a real nice, uh, real nice benefit and enabler for, for the program areas. Um, a couple of things looking back, you know, I would, like I said, uh, let, me, let me cover this. So functionality wise, obviously, you know, security was paramount. Um, Look around. There's a lot of security going on on uh, encryption at rest, encryption at transport, and so really I think of it as three encryption. So we get the encrypted at rest on the actual appliance. It also has some dedupe, uh, and then we get encryption at, at transport, and then of course once it hits the, uh, the S3 bucket, it's encrypted up there as well. The console was really nice from a manageability. So looking forward, and when we're trying to uh, trim headcount on what it takes to manage that, you know, console operations look pretty consistent and a whole lot easier as far as level of effort. And then um, the, uh, the mobility, like I say, we had a lot of people with iPads that were really stuck on those iPads and they really loved that now they've got their, their devices there, uh, makes it harder even to pry those things out of the enterprise. Uh, but um, looking back, some of the things, um, keep that momentum going. Uh, you know, if you've got the, if you're looking at functionality, you know, post implementation, we were looking at file server replacement and we forgot to really keep that momentum going on the, the mobile client and some of the next use cases. And so we're, we're spinning that back up and, and getting the mobile clients going on the mobile access. Uh, and also, you know, back to what I originally started with, preach often. You know, find not only yourself, but a couple people you can do some proselytizing. You've, you've got to get out there and, and remind them what, not only what you're doing, it's a different message for your IT staff, it's a different message for your program staff, but talk to them about the benefits so that when they realize these benefits, you know, they're seeing that. They're hearing, oh, this is what they said we're going to do, and, and we actually did it. Uh, and of course, you know, find a couple of partners. Uh, CFO was really supportive on this. Uh, we didn't think we were going to get some capex for it, and we did, uh, and that was real nice because we, uh, through that, we were able to, to actually accelerate quite a few things. Uh, and of course, when he saw the, the ROI, he was real pleased with that. Uh, and of course, you know, our business, most, most importantly, our business units were as well. So, uh, as we move forward, looking at that, you know, there's a lot of things we were pleased with, but overall, we ended up with more storage. It costs less, a lot more functionality. It's a whole lot more secure than we were on, on these uh, legacy servers. But anyway, we're going to do questions at the end. But uh, I'm going to introduce to you Brett Martin. He's the uh, principal research cons computing architect from H3 Biomedicine. And he has a uh, story to share with you as well. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> so. Uh, I'll give you guys a little bit of an overview of H3 Biomedicine, talk about some of our storage and compute challenges, uh, give you a little bit of an overview of our architecture and about uh, how we use S3 and EC2 and where I think we're headed in the future uh, from a storage perspective. So H3 Biomedicine uh, is a small startup biotech. Uh, we're located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We were founded in 2011 by scientists from Harvard and the Broad Institute. Uh, we're funded by a pharmaceutical company based in Japan called Azai. Uh, they've made a 10-year commitment to funding us, uh, funding our drug research. And um, <clears throat> our vision is to, uh, to take 
cancer patients' genomes and turn them into powerful therapeutics. So what that really means is we want to use the actual features of uh, cancer patients' genetic code to precisely understand the mechanisms that have gone wrong in cancerous cells and develop targeted therapies that could improve their lives and extend their lives. So <clears throat> we have a data explosion on our hands in our industry, um, and uh, part of the reason for that is uh, the cost of doing DNA and RNA sequencing has been dropping precipitously over the past few years. So this plot is uh, from the NIH, and it shows uh, the white line is Moore's Law, uh, the, the trend of Moore's Law, and then the green plot is the cost of sequencing a genome over time. And so you can see that it, uh, we're kind of outpacing Moore's Law. Um, because of those lower costs, people tend want to do sequencing more often, and uh, we can get uh, pretty good insights from that data. And so the fact that it's easy, uh, relatively quick, and relatively inexpensive, uh, and we can do useful things with those data, um, really leads to mounds and mounds of data. And this is a, a plot of how many uh, next uh, generation sequencing samples we've processed at age three since our inception. So we got started using AWS as uh, a way to augment our very modest uh, on-premises compute infrastructure. And um, so we used uh, an excellent package from MIT called Star Cluster, which is a package for uh, provisioning and managing high-performance computing clusters on EC2. Um, Bioinformatics pipelines, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with them, are typically composed of a bunch of disjointed command line utilities, and they tend to have very different uh, dependencies on other software and data. They have different input and output formats uh, and use different reference data. And so it's a little bit of a, a job to cobble these things together into a, into a working pipeline. <clears throat> but uh, much to their credit, our bioinformatics group managed to do this. And uh, they also used S3 uh, to store uh, both the input and output data from this pipeline. But one of the problems that we had with this, uh, this early uh, implementation of our pipeline was that it was completely separate from our local development environments uh, that we used to develop that pipeline. So over time, we've evolved to a little bit of a more mature model. Uh, we use... Um, a workflow manager called Luigi, which was developed at uh, Spotify, actually, but uh, works great for managing the components uh, and dependencies in our pipeline. And uh, we do a lot of the management of, uh, of dependencies in, uh, for our various tools in the pipeline with Docker. Um, we've managed to present a unified file system to our on-premises and cloud environments using a Veers product, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and so we have a much more seamless transition from local development and local, um, uh, local pipeline runs to scale out runs uh, at EC2. So our storage challenges, I think these are going to sound familiar to you, is really what most organizations have, right? We've got lots of data. It's growing really quickly. Um, we'd like to focus on our, uh, on our core competency, which in our case is, is drug research, rather than on managing storage and, uh, and on IT administration. Um, we have an investment in on-premises storage, and we'd like to, uh, we'd like to preserve that for a while, uh, while it's still got some useful lifetime. <clears throat> um, and it would be nice if we could present a traditional file system uh, to our users to bridge them from uh, the on-premises world that they're used to working in into the cloud. <clears throat> and longer term, we would like to get some of the benefits of object storage, uh, like the, the cost efficiency and simplicity. So our compute challenges, I think, uh, again, this will be familiar to a lot of you. Um, our, our demand for compute is, fluctuates quite a bit, especially because we're such a small company. Uh, so we can't really justify a significant investment in on-premises HPC infrastructure. So that means EC2 makes a lot of sense for us. We can have massive compute demands at peak times, but at non-peak times, there can be no demand. <clears throat> um, so obviously, we'd like to avoid making uh, major investments in compute infrastructure. But at the same time, we'd like to provide a familiar uh, and accessible environment for our scientists. Okay, so I won't go into uh, excruciating detail here on our architecture, but the, the, the important things to note here, um, we have a, 
a couple of VPCs, which broadly speaking are separated into uh, applications uh, and high performance computing work. And uh, we use Amazon's Direct Connect service to connect our Cambridge headquarters to the, um, to the US East One region. And one of the things that's really useful about that, I think this is kind of an undersold feature of Direct Connect, is that uh, when properly configured, you can use Direct Connect to access public AWS services like S3, which offloads that traffic from your uh, primary internet connection. At least for us, that was a huge benefit. Uh, so our on-premises uh, EMC Isilon NAS is located in our Cambridge headquarters, and we've deployed Avere's uh, virtual FXT solution uh, in one of our VPC subnets uh, at EC2. So I probably don't need to tell you too much about what the benefits of Amazon uh, S3 are, but I'll tell you a bit about how we use it. You can see what the benefits are for us. Um, so the way we use S3 today is to store public genomic data, so things uh, like uh, cell line data that's not tied to a specific patient, um, data that's not, uh, not protected by, by uh, the kind of regulatory concerns that you would have with uh, patient data. Uh, we process that data either on premises or, or really 90, 95% of the time at, uh, at EC2, and uh, we store the output data in S3 as well. Um, we used to receive data uh, it's, it's kind of funny to see the Snowball announcement today because we've actually, uh, we used to have sequencing providers who provided us data by shipping us hard drives, and now we have them deliver it directly into S3. Um, and I guess now we're going back to shipping hard drives. Um, but um, in the future, we would like to store some of that private data that we've to date kept on our, uh, on our local NAS. Uh, and that's really, um, you know, AWS does a good job of providing the security tools to make that possible. Um, and it's just taken us some time as a small organization to make sure that we were crossing, uh, crossing the T's and dotting the I's to, to do that properly. Okay, so <clears throat> with the Avere solution, we've been able to add a couple lines here, right, and, and make uh, a little bit of a richer ecosystem. So you all know what the benefits of, of EC2 are for us. Um, you know, we can, uh, without a cap, uh, significant capital investment, we can um, analyze more data than we would be able to do uh, with our on-premises infrastructure. When we add the Avere solution in, uh, we can access our on-premises NAS where we have a significant amount of data. That data is cached for EC2 instances. Uh, the latency uh, between EC2 and our Cambridge headquarters is reduced for active data. And it's presented using fi familiar file protocols. The virtual FXT solution um, from Avere can also be scaled uh, just by adding nodes to the, uh, to the Avere cluster at EC2. So it can uh, uh, grow in, and shrink with our workload. So what the Avere VFXT is, is it's a virtual deployment of Avere's uh, operating system using Amazon EC2 instances. It's the same software that runs on their on-premises physical appliances. In our case, we use three R3.2x large instances, and those are backed by four terabytes of encrypted Amazon store, uh, uh, EBS storage. So the great thing about that is the, the data, that data is encrypted at rest. Um, it's deployed with a uh, CloudFormation template, so if you haven't used CloudFormation before, it's a great uh, tool for sort of standing up stacks of infrastructure, and Avere's done a good job of making it easy to set up the VFXT with that. You can manage it with uh, either a web interface or, or command line via SSH. And one sort of unexpected benefit of using the VFXT for us was that we can get metrics on things like what files and clients are active and what performance we're getting both on our core filer and between the VFXT and EC2 instances. Uh, and that was data that we didn't really have good visibility into before. Okay, so where we're going uh, in the future is, you know, over time we've been moving our center of gravity to the cloud, and that's, I think that's gonna continue. Uh, and so we'll probably reduce our on-premises storage maybe to nothing eventually. Um, and uh, I, I, I see a, probably a physical deployment of a Veers FXT <coughs> solution in our future because uh, a feature that we're not using now, for example, is that uh, a Veer can act as a gateway into S3 presenting that object storage as file storage uh, for your on-premises sort of conventional file server usage. 
Um, and you know, those, all of this stuff is to drive forward our drug discovery efforts and hopefully uh, develop more therapies and do it faster and more cheaply. All right, and with that, I'd like to introduce Michael England, who is the storage architect at Electronic Arts, and he'll tell you about uh, their story with AWS Storage. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Michael England. As I mentioned, I'm a storage architect at Electronic Arts, and today I'm going to be talking to you about how we use uh, a combination of S3 and we use Panzura to enable our uh, build distribution systems worldwide. For those of you who don't know about Electronic Arts, we make games. Most people know that. What you don't know, maybe, is that uh, we have about 14,000 employees now worldwide. We're about $4 billion in revenue, which makes us one of the largest video game manufacturers in the world. Uh, we've grown mostly. We started about 1982. We've grown mostly through um, acquisition but through intellectual property development as well, and we've uh, amassed quite a portfolio of uh, a lot of titles you'll probably recognize, like FIFA, Plants vs. Zombies, Battlefront, which is highly anticipated coming out in November for all of you that play games, um, and Need for Speed, things like that. So we've, we've really made uh, a lot of uh, large titles that are out there and, uh, and um, a, a lot of distributed environments that we need to build those on. So I'm actually gonna give you a little overview of the technical challenges that we have in this environment, where we kind of come from and where we're going to. And to do that, I'm just going to show you a little video. I'm going to let it play in the background while I talk about the video. At least I hope I am. And hopefully I can make the sound less. Well, that's annoying. OK. Is there a way to turn that off without me doing something? OK, I'll talk over that one. Let that go. You hopefully you can't hear that much anyway. Wow, that's handy. Okay. You can control that. Awesome. So let's talk about these first of all. So on the left-hand side is where we started in 2005. So for those of you that remember when Xbox 360 came out, it actually came out a decade ago. I had to look it up because I was like, I cannot believe that was 10 years ago. But it was. Um, this was, by all definitions, relatively simple for us. We largely developed these titles in one location. Uh, we had mostly integrated quality assurance. We had localization, so people that translate things for us. And we had marketing that was all pretty much centralized. Uh, the technology at the time limited us. We had basically five gigabytes of storage that we could play with. That was our DVD size, and we had to run everything off of that and squish everything in. Around 2011 or so, we actually started breaking this apart. We ended up with more centralized teams, so our QA was merged uh, more to central locations, localization, again, people that translate games, you want them to be in locations where people speak those languages natively, so we moved those resources, as well as marketing. So we started centralizing a lot of those resources, and we started to having transfer all these build assets around the world. We had to pick them up and move them over to different locations. So move ahead to the current gen. Those came out in 2013. That's Xbox One playing there on the right-hand side. And what I'd like to point out about this, just at a very basic level, is it's actually snowing in both of those videos. Except the left-hand side, you can barely tell that it's doing anything. And now, we actually have snow. We have footprints in the snow. We control how the players interact with that. We've added huge amounts of new texture data into this. We've added new animation data into this to make everything smoother. And we've actually gone out and taken high-resolution LiDAR photography of almost every stadium in the world and put it into these games now, where we track the position of the lighting, we track the position of the stadium, we put people in those seats now that actually interact more. So this gives a very uh, dynamic and, and, and uh, much more engaging experience for our customers, but creates some huge challenges for us. We, we now are distributed across the world. We've got game teams that are now split up, and they have to collaborate with each other. And we have to get our builds to the QA groups in record time. We need these things to iterate very, very quickly so that we can get feedback back to the developers, as well as ship our products on time, which is a big, big challenge for us. As you'll notice there on one of those notes, it says game builds up to 120 gig. This is sort of infamous with Inside EA. Someone in Bioware decided to build everything for uh, the... Uh, the Dragon Age game, and I don't know if anybody's seen that, it's pretty epic in its scale, and they said, we're gonna put everything, every language, we're gonna put every release, every region, everything they could possibly do, and they ended up with these builds. We had a chat about that one, because that was kind of like, hey guys, you might wanna pare that down. This is not uncommon, though, for game teams to build something larger when they start off with, and we'll get one of those, maybe two of those a week, which we need to transfer around. And then as they get to finaling, they get down to that, that Blu-ray size of about 25 gig, but we'll end up doing 30 or 40 or 50 builds a day for them to transfer that around the world. 
Uh, our peak right now, our steady run rate is about four and a half terabytes a day that we upload into Amazon, and our peak rate is around nine terabytes a day that we need to, to manage into that. So it's quite a bit of, of data that we need to, uh, to push around and, and manage. Um, I'll show you a little bit about the infrastructure as it sat. Oh, I don't do this from here. Um, uh, this is the infrastructure that it sat before we went into Amazon. Uh, we, we have roughly 23 sites that we need to deal with around the world. Uh, we're spread out all over the place, and uh, each office had basically their own picture of storage. Uh, they had their own local NAS storage, and we had to transfer these builds across in a, in a, in a direct model. We had a point-to-point -point connection. So if I had to send a build over to, to two locations, I had to send it twice. I had to send all 25 gig, well, the new stuff is 25 gig, in, in series two times from that source. And we had to store it two times. We had to keep it at every single location that was there, and we keep it so that we can distribute and push those builds again and again and again into the environment. This is a big, big problem for us. So we decided, well, we can do a couple different things. We can either invest huge amounts of money into our uh, infrastructure. We can put way more into storage and way more into networking. Uh, or we can look at revolutionizing that. Now, these, are, I should mention, are all going across our, our internal MPLS networks, which was um, obviously an expensive commodity to have around. I don't know if anybody's ever been in a room with a network engineer and you sucked up all their bandwidth. Nobody's happy, right? And we did that across every site. So it became a big problem for us. So what we did, we implemented AWS S3 storage, and we put a Panzer gateway in. And the, the decision for doing that is, is pretty obvious now. At the time, it took a little bit of struggle to do it. But AWS really allows us to host one copy of that content, which makes it available for all sites at all times. And it also enables us to move away from those expensive MPLS networks and put it more into our internet traffic. So we end up with a lot more bandwidth available to our end users for a lot less cost. The reason why we put Panzura in there is really that, that for us, that connectivity piece back to um, the Amazon Gateway. We didn't want to spend a lot of time doing the S3 APIs, which you absolutely can do, but we didn't want to go through and rewrite all of that code. Uh, Panzura is one of the few that provides for that global namespace. We can access the same content from anywhere in the world immediately. So we didn't have to worry about transferring content or copying content. It was always around for us. The other pieces that it provides for us, and the reason why we're using that is uh, things like encryption. We, again, didn't want to worry about that, but obviously this is our intellectual property. We take builds very, very seriously at AA. We don't want those titles getting out before they're due on the street. Uh, that used to be a problem when I was a kid. That was, you know, everyone got that release before it came out, and, and we've worked very hard to, uh, to eliminate that problem. Uh, the other pieces that it provides, of course, is uh, deduplication. This is very important to us. Um, the content from today isn't that different from the content that was built yesterday. It's the same game we're building again and again and again and again and again. It's just we might improve the art assets, or we might improve a piece of code, or we might do something that a, a specific QA developer needs to work on. And so with the dedupe technology, we find we're able to transfer about 30% less of our current load, um, which makes a big difference as far as, again, our internet pipes and how we uh, handle that traffic load. To the business, uh, this has really been about collaboration. This is them getting their builds out on time to the right groups at the right time. Uh, if you can get a build out to a QA guy in 20 minutes and he can test that code and send feedback in, the game teams will take that every day. Uh, right? uh, most of the time, we're dealing with time zone changes. We run 24 hours now for our QA departments, um, so they're getting builds constantly and refreshing those and getting um, data back to the developers as fast as possible. It's obviously reduced cost by quite a bit. Um, everybody's got the same story, I think, reducing cost. That's why we do this, right? Um, we are only keeping one copy of that data. So at our peak, we were keeping about 1.5 petabytes of data lying around at all these different sites in all kinds of crazy storage formats, whatever we can get our hands on. And now we're at around 400 terabytes. We've stabilized down to about that level where we keep uh, those builds. Uh, dynamic ability of this as well is really important. So standing up a new site for us is as simple as putting a 2U appliance in. We slap it in, and it's immediately hooked up into that cloud infrastructure. Of course, when we download content, we need to download that from the cloud the first time, but it caches that as well. Each device has about 20 terabytes of cache that we host in and, uh, and keep things so we can reuse them. So instead of delivering to you know, one PS3 or one PS4, we can deliver it to eight of them at the same time from that one downloaded copy we have. Um, collaboration, um, 
the, the numbers on this slide are actually kind of funny. I'm not sure we put this together at 10 megabits. Most of our sites have 500 megabits plus that we're downloading this traffic on. We need enough uh, bandwidth to handle it. But a, a really important aspect of the cloud is that concurrency. So we upload content once from that source system, and we can download it from any number of sites that require it. So if, if QA and marketing and some translation re group require or just some executive that wants to play the game, we can distribute those all at the same time and do them in parallel. And Amazon's really enabled that scale for us. Um, when we first went through this, we were really concerned about how well they would keep up with that, that load, and they've never faltered for us once in that. Um, again, we can upload you know, at four or 500 megabits per second and then download at multiple gigabits per second across the world, which is really important to our, our business model. Um, the other side of this, the application side of this, um, is what really enables our users to, to manage the service. Um, you know, we're not talking directly to the Panzeras, not as a SIFS device. We actually have a front-end service that we call Shift. That's something we've developed internal. And Shift has a really uh, core set of functionality that we, we provide. It's taking um, the submissions that we do and actually validating against them. So when someone says they've got a PS4 build, we check it and say, are you really a PS4 build? And we check and, and uh, validate that. And we also fingerprint that. So we watermark every single build that we do so we can track its life cycle. We know exactly where it is, who's playing it, and when. So that if something goes wrong in that process, we can track down that origin, which is really important to our, our intellectual property protection. The transfer itself, again, Shift just sends it into Panzeras, and Panzeras manage that, that traffic for us, which I think, uh, again, just simplifies it for us uh, completely. We do have third parties um, that have uh, no Panzer devices. They're just out there, like, if we need to send it off to a contractor or something. And we use, again, those point-to-point -point traffic, but Shift on our side uh, masks that for us so we can get around the problem um, without too much trouble. And then, in the end, it's really about delivery for those services. Um, you know, we're, we're sending that data off to uh, either a console or we're sending it off to a PC or a mobile device. Those are, are much more popular now. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that say they don't play games at all, and then they've got five of them on their phone, right? And it's, that's just the new way of playing games, and we're delivering more and more content that way, which is important to our, our business model. Those, by the way, are easier to deal with. They're not 25 gig, but they're still, uh, still a problem for us in quantity. Uh, the cost reductions for this, uh, I think, uh, again, this is common. Um, the deduplication has really saved us a lot of efforts and a lot of cost into that process. We've been able to, to drive that down uh, considerably by taking the 1.5 petabytes down to about 400 terabytes. Uh, the WAN connections have been a really big savings. I, I'm sure everyone here has got MPLS of some kind or some sort of private circuit, and they are really expensive to manage and really expensive to scale. So by moving that to the internet, we've been able to really move our budget from millions of dollars a year over that refresh cycle down to, and this is 25,000 a month, but it's around a million bucks for that three-year cycle that we're doing. So it's, it's a substantial savings over that period um, where we just weren't able to do that. We rely a lot on uh, Amazon to provide the resiliency for that service. Um, we, we don't have a secondary copy of that. I mean, we, we build it locally, and then we send it to Amazon. But we no longer need to manage or worry about that content. Amazon worries about that availability for us and the performance for us. We don't, uh, we don't have to add extra services into that process. That's not working. So where are we going? Uh, so EA is actively looking at uh, expanding our Amazon footprint. We're looking at building in the cloud with EC2. Uh, this obviously presents some uh, challenges for us as far as security is concerned, so we're taking that very seriously and, and looking at that closely. But as we evolve, uh, there's new challenges coming down the road that I think uh, we're going to have to deal with very uh, carefully. 4K video is something that everyone loves to hear, and it is a nightmare for game developers because we're taking our content and we're multiplying it by a factor of 16 in order to get the initial sample data, and then we, we downscale it back again. We anti-alias it back down so you can actually end up with a finished product. But to drive that is, uh, is a monumental task, and it's going to require us to look at evolving how we, how we leverage the cloud services and, and uh, handle our performance requirements. Uh, yeah, and taking the cost out, we've really been able to take that cost and put it back into things like our application services. So Shift as an application obviously isn't free, and we've been taking a lot of the infrastructure savings and putting it into that, so we end up with game teams that have a seamless experience back to uh, delivering those titles for the users. And with that, I will turn it over um, to Isaiah. Great, thanks. So the building blocks of AWS, I think everybody can agree, are unlike any other provider. But nowhere 
but uh, excuse me, <coughs> nowhere but AWS are so many elements in one place, right? One platform that provides so many comprehensive services. And whether or not your organization has already begun its AWS chapter or you're about to embark on it, these building blocks are there to help you make your ideas reality. And everybody starts with this. Maybe they started earlier and they had less of a selection, but if they start now, this is what they get. Most organizations start out on some continuum of do-it-yourself. They want to take these building blocks. They want to see what they can create. And that's a natural part of the exploration of cloud. Automation and orchestration are made infinitely easier with these building blocks. And in many cases, you can now afford to start, and in many cases, finish projects that before you could only start and never finish. Completing these projects allows you to capitalize on managed services that are supported by these building blocks. But what happens when you find a gap? Every year, uh, I mean, people are calling this uh, National Amazon Product Release Day, right? So every year, Amazon makes great strides in being able to be all things for customers. But enhancements are prioritized for impact. What's going to make the most impact to the most customers? And as a side effect of this, we're bound to have some coverage gaps. So what happens to all your tribal knowledge that you had with your legacy deployments? Well, your organizations that perch upon your respective histories, the lifetimes of experience that you and your staff are propping up your teams with, you don't want to lose that. So how can we leverage that in the cloud? Well, that's where the Amazon Partner Network comes in. Those coverage gaps and the continuation of technology from your pre-crowd lives carries over to your cloud chapter. You don't have to lose the years and in some cases, decades of man hours that you've invested in enterprise solutions. And if this feels like eating your cake and, and having it too, or, or having your cake and eating it too, then it's actually not too far off. So the APN of the Amazon Partner Network includes thousands of technology partners, as well as systems integrators. So, I mean, both of those, we, we include them as partners. We just make the division of what type of partner they are based on the services that they offer the customer. And in the APN storage competency category alone, a lot of these faces are probably familiar to you. On AWS, all of these technology partners have created offerings tailored to AWS customers. So as an AWS customer, you don't just get what you had before, you usually get more. If you caught the gains that the customers that you heard from today achieved, and you would like to implement them for yourself, please take a look at the solutions that are available to you via APN. And they, I mean, it's really important to highlight that they actually exist to make you successful. We understand that our services are building blocks and that what you see on the Amazon Partner Network is there to supplement the gaps that those services have. So closing this session, if you haven't moved any workloads to AWS, our call to action for you is to look at your investments and just pick one. Just pick one. It doesn't have to be storage. It could be something else. Pick one with a presence on AWS. And if you've had trouble identifying a starting point, this could be a, a pretty great way to begin, just, just picking one and focusing on it. So, um, if you have moved workloads to AWS and you're not seeing the gains that these customers uh, have shared with you, then use this reInvent as an opportunity to make that happen for you. Visit the AWS Partner Solutions Explorer to help identify solutions that are best fit for you and your workloads. And um, also check out the APN competency program. There's competencies for almost every vertical. And uh, I think in the storage competency, there's four use cases. So there's primary backup, archive, and uh, disaster recovery. Uh, and file transfer, we added file transfer, right, Sabina? So thanks for attending. Uh, we're right on the mark. We didn't go over. Uh, we appreciate your patience and your listening, your attentiveness. Uh, please remember to complete your evaluation of the session as well. And see you all at the pub crawls.